Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Stollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is writer-artist Ron Randall. Ron, welcome to Comic Culture. Thanks, thanks for having me on the show. Ron, you are best known for your creator-owned series, Trekker, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about uh, the concept behind Trekker and when you first developed that. The nutshell is uh, Trekker is the story of a it's a science fiction series about a young woman who's a bounty hunter. That's about as, uh, as concisely as I can distill it down. Um, I also like to say that the series is, is sort of uh, conceived of as being a long form journey of self-discovery, coming of age story, something like that. But I, I cleverly disguise it as a series of self-contained action adventure stories because part of me is still a 12 year old kid that likes spaceships and explosions and crash landings on swamp planets and things like that. Um, it's it's a series that I, I I came up with back in the 1980s. So you know the the, the bygone bygone many years of yore um, when Dark Horse Comics was just starting out as a little black and white company, and I was already working uh, on a regular monthly book at DC Comics. Uh, but the uh, uh, Mike Richardson, the publisher of Dark Horse, uh, came up to me and introduced himself, saying he was starting a little comic book company uh, right in my own backyard in my hometown of Portland, Oregon. Um, and I, they were uh, interested in getting some established pros to uh, to do some work for their, their their line. A lot of people were starting up little black and white comic book companies back then. And I think uh, Mike, uh, who had some funds behind him and wanted to invest those in, you know, trying to create a good solid line um, of comics. Um, so they made me an offer to uh, if I if I came and worked for them, they they basically they used this phrase that's sort of like kryptonite to a comics creator. They said. If you come and work for us, we'll pay you, and you can do whatever you want. Uh, I've heard, I said I'll never hear this sentence again in my life, right? So I set about creating, frankly, my dream, my, my dream series, which uh, I've always loved science fiction in a lot of forms. When I was a kid, I loved Flash Gordon. Uh, I, I, found a, I stumbled across an Al Williamson Flash Gordon illustrated and written comic book in about 19 blah, blah, blah. It's about 1967, I think. Uh, and I, you know, I'd been reading comic books, Superman comic books, and sort of the standard fare. But I had never seen anything that looked or felt like like um, like 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 that. It was just lushly illustrated and highly romantic with a capital R. You know, idealized figures and grace and power and beauty, um, and and with characters who weren't flying around and smashing through buildings and stuff. They were just. Uh, <laughs> running around in swamp planets uh, and mountainsides with low slung blasters. And uh, it was very stylish. And uh, I just said, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be. Um, and as, as growing up, I was reading science fiction books like, uh, you know, Dune that had that expansive epic scale to it. Uh, and uh, I loved when, when, when the movies came out, the Star Wars movies, and a few years later, Blade Runner, Aliens, uh, just a, a wide range of different sort of things that science fiction can be. I loved all that stuff. Anyway, so back when uh, when uh, Dark Horse approached me, there just weren't that many opportunities to do those kind of comic books. Uh, it was the mid-1980s, and it was largely a superhero world, of course, in comics back then. So I thought, I got a chance to do something I want to do, science fiction. Uh, I wanted a strong female lead character because... I'd drawn comics, you know, of course, that had female characters in them. They tend to be relegated to the sidekick role, the, the eye candy role, the love interest, whatever. Um, but I kept thinking what it would be like to have that character in the center of the action, driving the stories. Um, which, you know, in the current landscape, that happens a lot. Back then, again, pretty rare to have an opportunity to do that. I, I wanted a, a series that could contain that wide range of science fiction stuff that I liked. So... I thought if I make her a bounty hunter, she can she can be you know have gritty crime noir sort of adventures like something out of Blade Runner, that kind of a setting, and then she can also uh, hop into a spaceship and go into outer space on another quest or journey. So um, anyway, that's a long answer to question, but I that was the germ of that's how I got it started, um, and I will give myself credit for answering the question of what would be my dream series pretty accurately because here it is thirty some years later and I'm still very passionate about continuing that journey. You mentioned some of the comics that you were working on. I, I stumbled across some of your earlier work. I think there was Conqueror of the Barren Planet. 
uh, or uh, I think that was the name. The, and bar then, the Barren Earth. Barren Earth. And then there was uh, yeah. an Arik story that I came across that you had yeah. worked on. And the one thing that struck me was that in both of the stories that I stumbled upon, they featured strong female characters within the context of the story. Uh, and mm -hmm. that struck me about Trekker as well. And one of the other things that struck me is that you've come up with uh, an interesting cast of supporting and, and I guess, co-leads to, uh, to Mercy's world. And I'm wondering, when you're developing the, the character, how important are those secondary characters to what you're doing? Um, they're, they're essential. Um, when I first conceived the idea, I knew, as I said, I knew from the very beginning that um, while, while, like I said, part of me is still 12 years old, and I like explosions and action scenes and that sort of stuff. Um, but as a, as a, as a writer uh, and, and as, a, as a real creator and storyteller, um, I needed the story to have a certain substance to it. And that substance is, is the character of Mercy St. Clair and the arc, the journey that her life is on. And um, the, the, at the beginning of the tale, you know, I, I wanted her steeped in this sort of gritty and grim and sort of violent world with her having a very black and white worldview. She shoots people. She's very good at that job and she gets paid for it. And that's, that's pretty much as far as her, that's that's where her scale that's where her scope is she um she doesn't want to be bothered by the inconveniences of you know being a human being and having connections with other people having perhaps an inner life that she hasn't yet explored um, the fact that the world beyond her door is sort of being shaped by these larger forces that are vying for power and stuff none of that stuff she, she didn't want anything to do with that you know, that's just the inconveniences but the the series is about about the way life has has a way of of prying us all open over time and exposing things to ourselves, whether we want to or not. Anyway, um, so if you have a series that sort of intentionally tries to be shut down, it's very important, I think, to surround that character with people who see her in a way that she doesn't see herself. Um, so that the readers can can get some other hints, uh, points of view early on that 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 th this journey is going someplace, that, that, her, that her life has places to go, that there are a lot of blank spots for her to fill in for herself. She is, she's a very self-defining character in lots of ways, but you know, we're all shaped over time by the people that we meet in our lives, by the experience that, that we have. And so those other characters are just as important as the experiences as far as helping to, helping Mercy uh, on her personal path of, of evolution and growth. Um, and making those, those secondary characters um, sort of fleshed out and having a, a sense of reality convincingness to them it is also important to to keep the reader, you know, buying into these tales as they go on. So, so essential, and it's important to try to do it really well. You said that the uh, Mercy is thinking of herself one way, but other people see her another way. So, as the creator of this character, when you start to think about all these facets, it seems like that's that's kind of complicated to come up with the character the way the character thinks she is, the way other people see her, and then I guess come up with different ways that other characters will see those different facets so that way everyone's not seeing the same thing. And I'm wondering, right. when, you're, when you're crafting a story, are you thinking about, well, this person's going to appeal to this side of the personality and this person will go to that side, or is it just organic and it just kind of comes as you're doing it? It's fairly organic now. Um, when, I, when I first started the series, um, I was, you know, I had, as I was saying, I. I'd been drawing um, professionally for DC for a few years by that point. So I felt I had a pretty good handle as a visual storyteller on, on how to shape sort of a, a, a sort of a, a good, you know, solid action adventure story. But I knew I didn't have the writing experience or the writing chops to be able to pull off this sort of long form epic of a character and the, the gradual, you know, incremental steps of evolution and have the story eventually expand in scope and scale as much as I wanted it to. Um, but I, but I, I just sort of say, well, I'll, I'll get there. As a writer, I will, I will develop as the series goes on. And uh, so I, I wanted to, in the first stories, my uh, intention was to sort of, you know, sort of plant some seeds. I would, I would establish a character making references to, to other things, um, and then figuring I would have time and space to develop those as I got a firmer grasp on everything as I went. So um, initially it was, it was quite intentional. She needs to have this sort of person in her life because that relates to this aspect of who she is, who she might become, whatever. And this person um, in her life in a, in a different function, in a different setting because she'll be there too. And that, that gives us something to 
someone for her to bounce off of that way. So uh, it was set up fairly intentionally, I guess, yeah. It's interesting because I think, you know, growing up reading comics, we might not think, oh, Lois Lane's the co-star of, of Superman. She's just the, <laughs> the damsel in distress. Right. But, you know, it without that dynamic, without having someone that, you know, Clark can turn to, he becomes a very flat one-dimensional character. And it seems that you're thinking along those lines as you're, you're becoming uh, uh, the writer artist, as you said. So turning from a visual storyteller to somebody who is now creating the stories that you are illustrating, is this something where you're, you're sitting down, maybe employing the Marvel method, you come up with a, a rough outline, or are you doing the, the DC method where it's you know, a page-by-page -page breakdown, or, or are you just kind of saying, well, I'm gonna start on page one and see what happens on page you know, 22? Thank you for asking that. At least the way that I approach it, um, the idea of that last scenario, you is just like the nightmare scenario. That's I just that's anathema to me. Um, uh, I came up working from fully finished scripts. Um, you know, w when I first started working in comics, uh, I, I was getting a fully finished script, and um, and working from that. And then I've I've done some of the, the the Marvel style or the plot style scripts as well. Either one can work well if you've got a good solid story, but. I know that for Tracker, for myself, um, to me, it's such a complicated thing to do, to, to write the stories, to draw the stories, just issue at a time, let alone this overall context of the the series. And where does this story fit into that? The story starts at this place. Where is Mercy as a character or whatever by the time this story ends? So I need to have that all laid out pretty, pretty well. Um, so by this point, again, when I first started it, I, I didn't have... You know, I was a beginning writer, so I, I knew vaguely that I wanted her to be on this large journey um, and she was going to have to grow and evolve. And eventually the series is going to have to make, you know, to, to meet its resolution. I didn't know exactly what all that stuff was going to be. I had vague ideas. Um, but by now I have I have an, a, an outline, a rough outline for each of the stories between here and, and when the series comes to an end and it's several years down the road. But I've got the basic beats figured out. I know where I'm going with the series. Um, so I've got that outline done. And then for each story, I approach it sort of the same way. Uh, when I'm talking to, to either artists or, or you know, uh, just comic creators at uh, um, workshops and stuff, I always say, I think the process is the same, whether you're, you know, trying to construct a figure uh, in, in drawing or, or trying to come up with a story. Uh, it's the same as if you're trying to build a house. You, you work from the big picture and then you work down to the smaller details. So you start with, you know, the architect's blueprint, which is um, the rough blocked in figure um, to, uh, uh, where you're trying to get the proportions right, trying to position the attitude, the, the, the torso, the arms, that sort of stuff. With a story, that's a story outline. So I start with an outline for where this, what this story is going to be. Uh, what's the sort of the action adventure aspect of it, the setting, because I try to have that shift from one story to the next, so it's not like two um, sci-fi western -y sort of stories in a row where she's like tracking down some mass murder through the blasted wastelands. I love that story. I don't want to do it every time. If that's happening one time, the next story is going to be set in outer space, set on the streets of the city. In some way, I like to change the settings of the stories. Equally important, in fact, more important really is, is to the setting is where is Mercy again as a character? Uh, what is she learning in this story that's going to position her to take the next step that she needs to. What has she learned in the previous story that is going to shape the way that she responds in this story? So that, that overall context is important. So I should get that outline figured out, and then I go through, and I, I will rewrite the outline a couple, two or three times, shifting scenes around, deleting a scene, expanding a scene, you know, till the, till the proportions of the story feel right, just like the proportions of a, of a drawing need to feel right. Then once that's done, once the, once the skeleton is there, uh, then I go back and I write a full script, uh, you know, page one, panel one, uh, establish a shot of this, you know, panel two. So I break it down bit by bit. Um, sometimes I'll gloss over a few things if I haven't got the dialogue quite figured out. Or I don't have the action choreographed. Uh, so I'll go through and write a draft of the script, go through and write another draft of the script as necessary. Um, and then I show all this stuff to an editor. Uh, I, you know, I write about these stories. I created the series. I know this world well. I believe everybody needs an objective set of eyes that have some professional perspective that they can shed on things because a good editor is always able to point out to me a few a few rough spots, a few things that maybe don't don't flow as smoothly as I'd like to, maybe don't even make any sense, um, or just go a little bit too much in one direction or another. So that's why 
that's why I flesh out the story. There's two things that I, I wanted to touch on, but the first is an editor. So this has got to be tough for you because Trekker is a comic that means a lot to you. So when you get that, that feedback, it must be difficult on a level. I mean, you're a professional, so you're used to getting some creative feedback. Uh, but at the same time, hearing something that maybe you've invested a lot of time into getting maybe some bad news about it, maybe it doesn't work the way <laughs> that you think it does. Uh, how do you, uh, again, I know you're a professional, but how does that, how do you uh, work that dynamic so that you're able to turn what could potentially be uh, a little off-putting for you into a positive? I think the best strategy I have for dealing with the delicate little flower that I am as a creative person um, is that I, um, I, I bounce every step off the editor. Uh, I show, I, I've shown my editor, who is a young woman named Alyssa Sala, who's really bright. And one of the things I love about working with Alyssa is she is uh, she's quite a bit younger than me. So her comic book background, the the landscape that she grew up immersed in of reading comics um, has something in common with mine. We have, you know, touchstones, but she also has this vast other uh, levels of, you know, of, of, you know, sensibility that um, that sometimes help to refresh my own thinking. So that I don't want Trekker to ever feel like, oh, it's it's a, it's a story that was created in 19, you know, 86. And it's been in a time capsule ever since. I'm doing stories in the year you know, 2019 right now. And while I want there to be a, a profound amount of continuity so the series holds together, that's all of one piece. Um, I don't want to feel like it's stuck in all the exact sort of storytelling you know, conventions or tropes, whatever you call it, that that were everywhere in 1986, 1987. Anyway, so so I'm I'm eager to get her feedback and her input. I don't always necessarily agree with 100 percent of it. Sometimes it's a little press. Oh, I got to go back and redo that or something. But by showing her the overall story outline, series outline first, so she's she knows what I'm really about, and then I show her the outline. Uh, an outline is um, fairly malleable. So uh, if, if if you think, well, I think maybe this scene needs to be expanded a little bit more or something, as I was saying, it's it's sort of more the same thought process I've already, already been doing myself. Um, so I work on that to, to the outline level with her. Then uh, I will uh, show my editor the, the full script and we can, you know, wordsmith the phrase to do here or work about a choice there or change the flow of, or the breakdown of the way some dialogue things go, working on the smaller details. It's easy to do that if you do, if you do all these these corrections incrementally at the various steps. Um, that that minimizes the amount of frustration and, frankly, the amount of reworking you have to do. Uh, this is a, crafting a series like this is a lot of work and it takes a lot of time. And I can't afford to waste time by doing a lot of work that I then have to throw out the window. Um, once in a while that happens, it's sort of unavoidable, but as much as I can do to minimize the chances of that happening, it just means I'm able to achieve the only goal that really matters to me, and that's doing more good Trekker stories as often as possible. <laughs> and then the, the other question that, that popped up um, was, you say that you've got everything worked out and you've got a few more years to, to tell these stories. Mm -hmm. When did that answer come to you that you knew that this was all one uh, not necessarily an epic, but one big arc that your character is going on. It was uh, baked in from the very beginning of the concept. Uh, I, as I say, one of the books that I that I loved when I was uh, when I was coming up was was the first Dune novel. It's about a character who starts off and you know he's he, he's a young man. He's got a sort of very narrow focus, and then by the end of the story, the the scale has just expanded massively. Uh, the the Trekker story isn't the same as that. Mercy's journey isn't the same as Paul's, but. Um, but I, but I love that sense of, of a story that starts off with a narrow focus and then expands and, and brings the reader along with it so that you aren't initially immersed into a world that is so vastly different and so complicated and so multifaceted that the reader has, um, can't, has a hard time getting their bearings. So I started Mercy on the streets of a gritty town that looks like a, a lot of cities gone bad <laughs> uh, that I think a lot of people could relate to and find their way around and connect with the character and those situations sort of on a visceral level. Um, so then as, this, as the stories go on, we continue to have that, that same common starting point with the character and her world. <laughs> I, I, I will say that um, there was a time at which I was, there was a long hiatus when I didn't when I had to set Trekker aside, um, 
I was only being able to work on the stories sporadically for a while, a short story here, a standalone story there. So it was coming out in a scattershot, unpredictable method. And that's a terrible way to try to tell a series where all the stories are supposed to be standalone adventures, yes, because that's important to me. I want each story to be a, a new reader-friendly story that has an entire complete adventure within the covers of each book. Um, but again, when you connect all those stories, they do relate and build off of one another. So having to continue to interrupt the story, maybe an issue would come out and then it would sort of disappear without people knowing it. Um, that was awful. So for several years, I set the, in fact, it was a dozen years. I didn't do any Trekker stories at all. I said, I will return to Trekker when I can get back and do the series in a way that serves the series and the readers and myself the best, which is on, on, on a more steady, regular, predictable format so that the momentum of the series doesn't have to keep getting interrupted and stuff like that. So while I was on that 12 year hiatus, uh, as I was getting ready to come back to it, that's when I took the time to take all the all the pieces that I'd assembled so far and finish fleshing out the rest of the series. Um, so that by now I feel much more confident in, uh, in where I'm going and how I'm going to get there step by step. And as I uh, recall, you're doing things differently. You, you're putting out uh, a book rather than an individual issue. So you're putting out perhaps an arc so that you've got that great beginning, middle and end, but it's over more pages uh, and you're going through a new means of distribution. You're not going to Dark Horse at this point. You're doing this uh, by connecting directly to your readers via Kickstarter. So I'm wondering how that sort of came to be because that seems like a really interesting way to, to get fans engaged, but at the same time also not worry about that monthly book that's got to come out. Now you can just tell that whole story and give them a complete uh, arc. Yeah, uh, I, I smile when you say it's a really interesting way to do it. It is, it's interesting, it's, it's, it's all consuming. Um, but it's it's incredibly rewarding. Uh, as you say, I I, I, um, I was working with Dark Horse, but because of the, you know, because and the Dark Horse has always been great to work with on a creative level. They've been very supportive. Uh, they're, they're, they're really a good company with great, great production values, uh, you know, a great, I think a great and well-deserved track, you know, history and track record in the industry. And Trekker got its start only because of Dark Horse and Mike being there uh, to help me out at the right place at the right time. But it just got to the point where the, the, the publishing schedules and, and the way that they need their line to work, you know, uh, I, I wasn't able to get Trekker stories out with Dark Horse, on, again, on, on, on the pace or, or the timeline that, that I thought really, really served the series and myself the best. So eventually I said, um, you know, I'd heard about Kickstarter. I knew some co fellow creators who were, who were using it as an avenue to put out books that sort of like Trekker weren't, weren't fitting as comfortably into some you know, of the established publishing houses, you know, schedules and, and needs and, and whatever they wanted their, their line to, to look like and work like. I'd known some, uh, some, some colleagues who had used Kickstarter to successfully fund their books. Uh, and so I thought, well, I, I think I need to give that a try. Again, just, I, I felt I owed it to the, to the series. So uh, I crafted the first campaign and, and ran it, uh, having absolutely no idea. <laughs> What the response is going to be? I thought, well, this this could be a this could be a colossal <laughs> disaster, a waste of time, or something like that. But uh, I was immensely gratified that it funded pretty readily, and um, and the, the support has been been nice and and growing, and that's that, that's very gratifying. Um, and yes, uh, the way that I'm working these stories and running a Kickstarter is, is as I say, for me, it's an it's an incredibly uh, labor-intensive task, and then the fulfillment and all that stuff. So uh, to do that, um, to make it worth all that effort, I want to put out a book that's a substantial a substantial story. So uh, th these are trade paperbacks or graphic novels that are 120, 140 pages long. And usually, actually, they have, have uh, one main story, a long story, like the main feature in a movie. And there'll be a couple of shorter stories in, in the back of the book that um, just flesh out some of the uh, some of the um, secondary themes or, or little bits of f follow up uh, action after the main adventure happens. Little anecdotal stories that I think enrich uh, enrich the overall world and the setting and the context of the stories. Give a little bit of extra information maybe about some of the other characters like we we're talking about and and the the continuing expanding sense of the whole series. So I, I, I really love the flexibility that the trade paperback format gives me as far as the scale and scope I can work the stories in, and uh, 
uh, and sort of the schedule as well, uh, a regular monthly or even in Trekker, like a, a bi-monthly schedule, which is what the book was when I did it at Dark Horse. Um, it was it was pretty demanding when you're trying to do all the work yourself. You know, I, was, I couldn't get away from the fact of what's the next story going to be and when can I get these next five pages in, you know, to the to the to the publisher, that sort of stuff. So uh, this is a more um, is a slightly more comfortable fit, despite the fact that it's a lot of work. <laughs> So Ron, we have about a minute or so left in our conversation. And I was wondering if someone watching the show wanted to find out more about Trekker, where can they find you on the web? I'm all over the place. Uh, I'm on uh, Twitter at uh, Ron underscore Randall and uh, Facebook, you can find me. I have a Ron Randall's Trekker Facebook uh, fan page. Uh, I have my own website, ronrandall.com. You can find all of the Trekker stories are archived and available to read for free digitally at trekkercomic.com. Uh, the Kickstarter that I run, and I try to run one about every nine months, eight or nine months, uh, they can find them all at uh, trekkerkickstarter.com. Um, and I think that's pretty much, I have an Etsy store. You can find me online pretty easily. <laughs> well, Ron, I, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to talk with me today. And I'd like to thank you at home for watching Comic Culture. We will see you again soon. Comic Culture is a production of the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke.